So to start, I'm going to start with the Dow Jones. And the reason I like starting with the Dow Jones is because it gives us over 120 something years of history on the chart. And what I love the most about drawing fibs from the top to bottom here is you can really see market psychology uh, play out on this chart, um, even from an all-time perspective. When you're looking at these levels on a Fibonacci chart, there are, there are several areas and each level represents an emotional and psychological level. There's a reason why Fibonacci is used and it's because everything in life follows this pattern. Uh, whether it's organic or inorganic, it's really kind of fascinating. If you just do a simple Google search and just type in Fibonacci sequence and look at the images, you'll start seeing pictures of things like the shape of our galaxy or the shape of pine cones or how pineapples grow or flowers, uh, the shape of a hurricane, uh, all the way down to the strands of DNA in your body follow this, uh, this golden ratio pattern. And it's not just like, oh, it's kind of close. It's, it's like dead on, it's exact. So it doesn't surprise me then that human behavior also follows this pattern. You, in your behavior every day and over long periods of time, you exhibit this kind of behavior following Fibonacci patterns and you just don't know it. Um, we can see here that on this chart, if we just stretch it all the way from, from, from low to high, the longest consolidation period in its history was right here on the 0.5. And the 0.5 is the most important line on a Fibonacci chart. It is where things retrace to, and if they don't bounce, we'll continue to go lower. And if it does bounce, it continues an uptrend. This golden pocket down here is an area where psychologically and emotionally, people will say, holy crap, that's cheap. I want to buy that uh, in a bull market. In a bear market, it is the opposite. It's inverse. If things are falling down in a bear market and then bounce back up to the golden pocket, like we saw here, it is where people say, wow, I can get a lot of money for this and I can get out here with a pretty you know, you know, good amount of money and they'll sell it off. So just looking at this all-time history of America and finances, we can see that we came running up all the way up to here and it rejected and it came down into this area called Sniper's Alley. Sniper's Alley is a term that Keith dubbed it, and I really love the name, um, and I have that kind of marked off in blue. And so basically, if something fails Sniper's Alley, it's basically over. Like, you can consider it like game over. And so in hindsight, drawing this, we can see that America almost collapsed financially, and it would have been the end. Um, but it didn't. It recovered right here and came back up, and then, you know, the rest is history. If I, uh, you know, people will also tell me, oh, well, you know, everybody just draws these lines now and they will just buy when it gets to that line. And so it's basically your own self-fulfilling prophecy. And my argument to that is, well, we haven't had the ability to chart like this, having computers um, forever, right? It's only kind of just been recently. So to make an example of this, let me just stretch my fib chart all the way back down to this peak here. And then I'm just going to zoom in. And we're just going to pretend that we are in 1930 at the height here, right? And this is before computers. This is before people charted. This is the, the only information you had is when you got your newspaper in the morning and you could look at the price, right? And this is what everybody, how everybody determined if they wanted to buy or sell. And so I'm just going to hit the replay function and take us back to 1930, right? So once again, no, no ability to chart, and we can just play this out and see what happens. Now, this is the worst America has ever seen financially. People were really poor. There was uh, rations of food. Things were really tough. Families had to do whatever they could to survive during this time. But you can clearly see, without the ability to chart, these lines are still being reactive. And the reason is, is not because everybody's waiting for this line to touch, to buy or sell, it's because these are psychological and emotional levels in the human psyche and human behavior is reacting to these levels. So you can clearly see we tried the 0.5 there and it failed. We came down into the golden pocket and what happened? Everybody's poor. Nobody has a whole lot of money, yet somehow they're finding enough to buy this right here in the golden pocket where everybody says, holy crap, that's cheap. Because it is a psychological and emotional level 
where people can't help themselves. You know, they're like, I, can't, I have to take advantage of this, of this fire sale right now and scrounge up whatever I can to buy it. And you can clearly see that that's what happened. And this is without any ability to chart. So in my opinion, this proves that these levels can be used to determine and predict human behavior before it happens. <clears throat> As this continues, we can see that this is where it got bought up. It came up here, it found support on the 0.5, made a big run. And then if we measure the downtrend, just like in a bull market where you wanna buy in the golden pocket, well, let's measure this downtrend from the top to the bottom, like it's a bear market. Well, where did it first sell off in the golden pocket? Because people said, wow, I can get a lot of money for my, for my Dow Jones stock, I'm gonna sell it there. And so it's just inverse in a bear market. And we can use this to our advantage in a bull market or a bear market. So if I go over to something like uh, the NASDAQ, I can plot out trend lines. Trend lines are very useful. And this trend line stretches all the way back to December of 2008, right after the housing crisis collapse, right? And if we bought there, well, we're doing really well now. And so basically I stretch this trend line out to try to touch as many candles on all the dips as I possibly can. And so what I've determined by just this one trend line alone is that anything underneath it is of extreme value, at least over the course of the last, you know, 15 years almost. <clears throat> if I zoom in, I can see we hit that trend line just recently. Very close to it. Now, if we fall below it, that would, might be a value area to buy, maybe, depending on you know what else is going on and what other charts I'm looking at. Um, but I don't know if I would buy just because it hit there. Um, I do want to see some sort of reversal and cross bullish of some EMAs before I decide to buy, because at that point, you're just taking a big risk of buying the dip that is not confirmed yet whether or not that's the bottom. And we could potentially see more bottom, maybe the golden pocket down here where people say, holy crap, that's cheap, right? Uh, and on this fib, I drew from the bottom of March when we had the COVID drop all the way to the all-time highs. I can also see that we are in a falling wedge, which is a bullish pattern at some point whenever it breaks. So I'll be waiting to watch for that. On a monthly scale, if we just use, let's say you don't have a lot of time, right? Let's say you don't have time to day trade all the time like I do. Well, that's fine. You don't need a whole lot of time to do this. You can just pick your, pick your points, right? And so if we just went to a high time frame and use the 821 MA as our indicator, you could do really well over long, long periods of time. You just buy when it crosses bullish and you sell when it crosses bearish. And it hasn't even done that yet on a monthly time frame. Now, this is 10 years apart, right? So this would be a super, super long-term trading strategy. This might be when we turn bearish here and cross bullish again, this might be when you wanna start your children's IRAs, you know, is on this dip. Um, because over the long-term, you can clearly see that, you know, the term's correct, stonks only go up. Um, <clears throat> But on, let's say you have a little bit more time and you want to do some swing trading. Well, you can go to a weekly or daily and just do the same thing. So if we look at the weekly, after the March drop, we crossed bearish right here. I'll zoom in just a little bit so you can see that better. So we crossed bearish, but we immediately popped back up and crossed bullish again here. And we could have just bought here and waited and waited until we saw a bearish cross, which would have been in January of this year. And then we just wait. We wait for this to crush bullish again until we buy. In the meantime, we can short the market. Um, and, and every single time, maybe you can try your entries. Every time it touches the 8MA, you can try to short. You can see every time it kind of did this, more often than not, it fell some more. Here we had a big green candle up and it closed over the eight. So maybe you want to wait because it closed over. Found a top and fell once again. We could try to short on the retest of the 8MA here, take it down. And you don't want to try it every single time. You don't have to. You know, it's up to you what, what kind of what your risk appetite is. But what you want to do is you don't want to actually 
try to short when you're this far away from the MAs. You wanna wait for it to come back and retest. And the reason being is you wanna keep your risk small. So let's say this thing came up and I see it pull one big red candle down through both of them again. Well, now I'm gonna be looking to short again. So I'm gonna wait for a retest. So it came down in the very next week, came down here and the next week came up to retest again. So maybe that's my entry. So I can go ahead and take an entry here, short. I'm gonna make my stop loss as close as possible. So maybe I wanna make it like just above the 21 MA because if it ends up coming up through here and turning around, well, now we're bullish and I don't wanna be in a short, right? And then I can just take my, my exit on the next red candle down. And so my risk ends up being this little bit here, 2.76%. And my potential gain is history, it's all the way down. So I'm risking very little by entering on MAs and keeping my stops close to the next MA. And then I can just take it down. <clears throat> That's a strategy that you can use just using the 821. Why do we want to short? The main reason we want to short the market is because it offers potential. Just like in a bull market, you can flip this thing upside down, invert the scale, and look at look at how much of a, of a bounce this has had if we pretend like this is a bear market and this is a bull market. People would love to buy this. You have an 821 cross, that's your potential buy, and it goes up. So if you're ever in question of like, you know, it, is this a buying opportunity to the downside? You could just flip your chart around and pretend it's a bull market because a lot of people have trouble um, just with the concept of trying to make money when a market's going down. Um, and I totally understand that. <clears throat> uh, well, we can look at other factors too. So when we look at something like crypto, these things have massive runs and then massive declines. Whereas the stock market is a lot more um, kind of reliable and very, very few huge uh, percentage changes. Uh, it takes a lot longer for your investment to go up and a little longer for your investment to go down compared to crypto. When we look at Bitcoin on a weekly scale, we can clearly see that we went bearish in December, very close to the time when the stock market went bearish. So if we just do the same thing here, we don't want to buy until we see a cross, bullish. And you can see that happened back here in May of 2020. And if we just bought Bitcoin on the on the bullish cross, we got it at around 8,000. And we just don't sell until it crosses bearish at somewhere around 43, right? And that's an amazing, amazing gain and an amazing investment. Uh, in the meantime, it came back up and crossed bullish here. So you could have done the same thing and bought on the cross and sold on the cross below. It wouldn't have been nearly as much as the first time, but it's still a profit. So now we've gone bearish. And if we look and use some other indicators, we can kind of see this here on the MACD and RSI. So the RSI is the relative strength index. It measures the strength of a market. Inside of this, you have two, three areas that you want to watch. You have the top line of the RSI, which is overbought at 70. You have the bottom line of the RSI, which is 30, and that's oversold. And then you have this midline at 50, which is neutral. If you have something that is this overbought, it is kind of like a danger zone of whether or not you want to buy or not. It can stay up in here for a very long period of time and continue to make new highs, but it's not somewhere you want to kind of do a long-term bet on. Where you want to make a long-term bet is kind of where we are now. You know, if you, if you believe in the future of Bitcoin, let's say over the next 10 years, this might be a good spot to start accumulating just based off of the RSI. <clears throat> but for me, I'm probably not going to go long on it until I see at least get up over the 8MA on a weekly time frame, which we're still very far away from. So in the meantime, I've been doing the same thing. I've been waiting for the touch of the 8MA to go short. And right now we're really far away. So I'm kind of laying off the shorts only when I see them on lower time frames, I can take advantage of them, but I wouldn't be swinging anything right now, um, long or short. Up here, when we went 
uh, bearish on this cross, that would have been the time to possibly start swinging, right? And you could, you know, get in on a retest and take it a couple of weeks and take your profits. Try it again. When you see big single candles breaking through both MAs at the same time, that is a big indicator of that direction. And you can see that happened here. So this, we got up above, we had a, I'm not so sure candle here. This is called a spinning top uh, doji candle and it's called a, a shooting star. Um, the opposite would be a morning star down below. If you flip this upside down, it would look like that. But then you see a big candle shooting straight back down and our MAs never crossed, they're still bearish. This was a big short indication right here. We closed the candle below both in one shot. And after that, we've just been straight down. So you can use candlestick patterns, you can use chart patterns, you can use the 821 MA, you can use all of these things to your advantage uh, and, and, and do really well over a longer term. When it comes to day trading, I do not recommend anybody to just jump into day trading if you've never learned technical analysis before. I recommend studying, um, learning patterns, watching YouTube videos. Um, there's a lot of free content out there. I offer one-on-one -on -one sessions to get you started and to possibly continue. If you like it, we can do more uh, at a discounted rate afterwards. So <clears throat> with that said, I've only spoke for 15 minutes and I'm kind of through macro other than maybe showing you how I would short this with fib levels. So let's just say I find the all-time high and actually I'm gonna rewind here. Let's just pretend we're here. This downtrend has finished because we got a green candle, a green candle, and we've kind of changed directions. So this is something that I can measure even on a weekly chart. And I can draw down to the bottom. I can say, okay, We've crossed bearish on the 821. We have bearish divergence on the MACD and the RSI. because I can see that here as well. And that means the RSI and the MACD are trending down while the price is trending up. This is telling me that the second wave where we came and made new all-time highs was fake. It wasn't nearly as strong as the first one, yet we made a higher price. And then we have a bearish cross on the A21MA. And so I'm gonna be looking to short this, but I need to find my entry, right? So I can measure this downtrend and see that my 0.5, which is the most important FIB is right here. So this is gonna be where I try to find my entry. And if I play this out, I can go ahead and take my entry right there. So there's my entry. I'm gonna make my stop as close as possible. So I might, you know, find some candles over here that offered some sort of support and resistance. I can see one there, which is also my golden pocket, but that's kind of far away and I would like to be a little safer. So maybe I would pick something like right here where I can see these candle tops hitting. I got some wicks that rejected there and I got all these wicks that rejected here, right? I got all these like tops happening. So my risk is only, you know, 3.59%. You know, so I could do a five times short here, you know, and my max loss would be somewhere around 15 to 17%, you know, and I'm okay with that. It all depends on your risk appetite. So if I'm going to throw 200 bucks on this short, the most I can lose is like $40, right? And so I'm willing to risk $40 to bet that this is going to continue into a bear market and that the cycle is over. And so we can clearly see that that is what happened. It rejected that 0.5 perfectly, especially with that spinning top uh, doji candle. And so you can clearly see that these, these, these indicators and these tools can very, very accurately predict human behavior. Now, when I go and do my classes and one-on-one -on -one sessions with people, this is kind of what I cover in the beginning. And afterwards, I can show you how you can do this on smaller time frames in order to you know maximize your gains um, over shorter periods of time. So if that's something you're interested in, the uh, link is uh, pinned in my channel. <clears throat> so as far as shorting goes, I want to kind of go into 
what that looks like, but I'm going to use my phone to do it because it is way easier to use your phone uh, to enter trades on QPoint, especially. And so I'm going to start my screen share here. And then just let me know if you guys can see it. Recording in progress. Uh -oh. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we're getting feedback, so you're going to have to turn one of your mics off. It's not good. How do I? Okay, how's that? Perfect. All right, so now I'm going to try to share my screen. All right, can you see my screen? Yes. All right, fantastic. So let's say I wanted to enter a trade using leverage um, for Ethereum. In Qcoin, and this works for Binance, FTX, BitMEX, Bitfinex, like they all have this very similar setup, so it would just have a different user interface, uh, but all the same concepts. So let's say on my charts, I think this is the bottom, right? at you know, there's a nice wick here. My trend lines kind of tell me that maybe this is, a, you know, a local bottom and I want to try to, you know, long this to make some profits. Well, you can either do one of two things. You can go into the futures tab here and then click this. Actually, let me kind of see my cursor on my screen here floating around, right? So sure if you can. Click area up here. So give you your options for what you can use to buy or short. And there's a whole long list. What I usually do is just go over to markets and, you know, I have my favorites saved in here and I can just pick whatever I want. Now I'll pick Ethereum. And then down here at the very bottom, there's this little 100X button. So I can just click that if I want to go to my futures. And in here, you can <clears throat> select your leverage in this area here, however much you want. You can hit buy or sell. If you want to go long, you click buy. If you want to go short, you would click sell. And then let's say I want to just enter this at market right now. Well, you can either hit this limit button right here and select market, and it'll just enter you at the best price possible, or you can stay in limit. I stay in limit because if I want to market buy, I can just go 1085 and enter the trade long, you know, and just hit buy long. And that'll market buy it underneath 1085. If I'm short, then I want to short at like 1080 to market buy it, for instance. So you would just go under whatever the price is if you wanted to market buy it. And it's just faster that way. The reason I like using the phone is because I can enter and exit trades much quick, much quicker. I can just, you know, market buy this at 1086, hit 25% and hit sell short, and I'm in the trade. Now, if you're going to be more precise, like let's say your charts are telling you at a certain area you want to short. So on my chart for ETH, I could go to a shorter time frame, and I'm on my computer again, so you can't see. But basically, if I'm going to draw fibs on this, and I think this is going to continue downward, it's probably going to hit and react to 1089. That's what it looks like. So we'll see. Maybe I want to go short at 1089. And so if I want to do that, I can set the limit order for that. And I can say I want to go short at 1089 and I can hit sell short. And that'll just enter me into the trade. And you'll see it here in my orders. If it shows up here anytime soon. Seems to be lagging. There we go. All right. So here you can see. At 1089, I'm going to go short. And it won't fill me until it reaches that price. And if it never reaches that price, I'll just never get filled. And that's okay. If I want to, I can just hit the cancel button here and cancel it. And my money is returned back to my available UST at 400. When I, when I do this, I only have a certain amount in here. And it's because, let's say I only want to risk $100 per trade. Well, I want to have $400 in here then because I like utilizing these 25, 50% buttons. I don't want to have to like go 1085 and then try to figure out how much ETH 
you know, that might be at this leverage. So that would be $33. Well, I want to risk 50. So then I got to like, you know, come in here and monkey around with some math to try to figure out what that is. I don't want to do that. I want to just enter the trade at 25%. hundred dollars is what I'm willing to risk. And I want to get in. <clears throat> now there's these little buttons here that are really helpful. So let's say I want to go ahead and enter my take profit and stop loss before I enter the trade. Because on my chart, I have determined already where my entry is. I have determined my max risk, and I know where my stop loss is on a percentage basis because I can measure that on the chart. And then I can go ahead and measure where I think we're going to at a take profit level. And I can go ahead and enter all of these things on here. So let's say I want my take profit to be, mm, you know, 1,000 because I think we'll retest 1,000 again. But I want my stop loss to be 11.05. Well, it's going to tell me what my profit is and what my potential loss would be if it hit my stop. So this is really useful, too, because I can go ahead and look at what that might be before I even enter the trade. So if my max risk is 10 percent, well, this looks pretty good. And if my take profits at a thousand and I can make 40 percent, well, that's almost a you know, that's a five to one risk to reward ratio. These are the kind of ratios you want. These are the kind of trades you want to get yourselves into. Um, if I only have to win five trades out of 10. Um, like this to be profitable. Because if I'm losing five trades at 9% or 10% and I'm winning five trades at 20 to 40 to 50 to 60%, well, then I'm making a good amount of money. And if I can consistently do that, I'm making money over a long period of time. And all you need is discipline and risk management to do that. You don't even have to be that good at technical analysis. If you have really good risk management, then you will do well. You just can't be the guy who's FOMOing. You can't be the guy who sees a huge green candle and chases it. You can't be the guy who sees a huge red candle and sells out of emotion because you're mad. Um, you have to trust what your charts are telling you. And you have to understand that the psychology of market makers is to make you panic or to make you feel greedy, depending on what kind of market you're in. Um, so you want to understand psychology. You want to understand math. And you want to understand how to read charts. I'm just a regular guy. I started in construction when I was 17 years old, and I did that for 20 years. I did go to school for mathematics, and I did calculus, and I was fascinated with geometry. And my other, my second favorite class in college was psychology. Uh, I loved how the human psyche worked. And so it took me until I was almost 40 to realize that maybe this is what I want to do with my life because I love math, geometry, and psychology so much. And then I realized that that's how markets move. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. So just a regular guy who worked construction can do this, so can you, this is what I'm saying. It just requires a little bit of work, a little bit of time and some effort and accepting failures is the biggest thing. Some people will look at failure as a reason to quit. I look at failure as a reason to try harder. And it's all just all about perspective. So with that, we've covered macro trends, how I determine you know, the, the current direction of markets and how to enter longs or shorts using Qcoin. And uh, I'd like to maybe open it up for some questions now. Do you want to swap back to your, uh, your desktop first? Yeah, I'm going to do that. Did that end? Uh, yeah, 